Thank you very much, Martha. Thank you, Marie, Bowen, Katie, Grena, and Lauren Reed for organizing and, and inviting me to take part. It's really my pleasure to do this. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation here, so one thing I'll say is that I've, I've heard that power corrupts and that PowerPoint corrupts to a point. <laughs> so I don't do this often, and, and hopefully no one will leave corrupted. Um, what I'm talking about today is, is I entitled the talk Back to the Future, Digital Islamic Law. And before I talk about either of those, I'd like to just ask you to imagine first the process of conducting legal research in American law a quarter of a century ago. So imagine a world where you have to go to the library stacks in the basement of the library to look up a case in a reporter this is familiar to some of you. Uh, then thumb through the indices of separate volumes where you're trying to see if there have been updates to that case and related holdings. Or you could shepherdize the case by obtaining the appropriate volume of Shepard cit Citator, the collection of cases that tells you whether the case you're looking for uh, or that you're looking up has had any recent updates. And of course, you'd need to check for any new supplements even to that. The relevant secondary literature would be in an entirely different section of the library if it was available at all, altogether. And that was the state of American legal research up until about the 1990s. And that is the state of Islamic legal research today. So now let's talk about uh, Back to the Future, the movie, for a second. Remember that the premise was that a teenager, a young Marty McFly, was accidentally sent 30 years into recent history in a time-traveling car. This is where I'm asking you to bear with me on the PowerPoint. Uh, he had to facilitate the connection between his high school age parents to ensure his own existence back in the future. And the film was a blockbuster in 1985, to the point it was so successful that then President Ronald Reagan mentioned it in his State of the Union address a year later. So aside from the enthralling storyline, the movie was perhaps most notable for its innovative special effects, uh, the way that it tried to link this concept of history and technology. And indeed, the creative use of technology came to bear on a rather old storyline, one of time travel for science fiction movies, to create and display new possibilities that ended up stretching both the storyline and the imagination. And that's what contributed to its success, and some critics would say, to the way science fiction movies were done thereafter. So what does all this have to do with Islamic law? I called the talk back to the future of Islamic law or digital Islamic law because I too want to highlight the importance and possibilities of joining history and technology together in this field. So in essence, I want to share parts of my work that operate on the premise that the creative use of technology can bring the history of Islamic law into contact with new possibilities for legal research and analysis. And I want to call that digital Islamic law. So from here, to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about and why it matters, I'd like to spend the rest of the time on two things. First, sharing some of my own research on a concept of doubt or reasonable doubt in Islamic law as an illustrative model of the state of legal research in this field. And second, exploring how digital Islamic law can improve the state of research in the field, suggesting some new possibilities. So as to the first, the book uh, on doubt, my major project over the past several years has been to investigate the role of doubt in Islamic law. In my research, I place particular emphasis on the history of Islamic criminal law. Islamic criminal law is supposed to be the clearest and most certain of Islamic laws descended directly from God with harsh real world consequences. Strict punishments can literally mean the loss of life or limb in that context. 
And the history of Islamic criminal law is especially important because Islamic law is somewhat of an originalist legal tradition. Muslims view the laws articulated during Islam's early founding period from the 7th to 11th centuries as more authentic and foundational. And for that reason, the history of doubt in Islamic law ends up revealing a lot about the nature and complexities of Islamic law itself. So stated very briefly, my work on the history of doubt calls into question a popular notion about Islamic law, one that's shared by Muslims and non-Muslims, adherents and critics alike. And the notion is that Islamic law is a divine legal tradition that has little room for discretion or doubt, especially in Islamic criminal law. And I argue that this notion is false based on a host of uh, sources Instead of rejecting doubt, it turns out that medieval Muslim scholars largely embraced it. In fact, these scholars held doubt so closely that doubt came to be at the center of Islamic criminal law. And furthermore, these scholars embraced doubt in ways that helped them construct the system of Islamic criminal law, which they simultaneously claimed to have divine origins. So in the book, I examine the process, this process of construction through interpretation. But it was significant to me that in the process of writing the book, I faced significant challenges in accessing sources and conducting research, especially compared to the ease by which I was able to access American legal sources. And so that's what I want to focus on. So let me walk you through the process of looking up a single case in Islamic law amongst the, the hundreds or thousands to give you an example of what I mean. So to look up a case from, say, 9th century Baghdad, you'd need to travel to one of only a handful of some four or five well-endowed libraries, generally sprinkled along the East Coast, if you're, if you're here in America, which boasts significant collections of sources on Islamic law. The Library of Congress is one of them, but that's pretty much inaccessible. You can't browse, you can't park hard to get in. Princeton Firestone Library is a second, but the university, as good as it is, uh, has no law school, which would be significant if you were interested in comparing your findings to other legal systems in a law school environment with a scholarly interest, sources, and expertise to engage that sort of study. Uh, and, and thus, when I, was, when I was in school myself, I sort of shuttled between Princeton and, and Yale Law School for that reason. And then there's Harvard Law Library, an extraordinarily well-endowed library on Islamic and, of course, American and comparative law with an accessible collection located at a law school. And sometimes you can even park. So in order to conduct research on Islamic law here, you'd probably go down to uh, the bottom, the basement of Langdell, where the Boeing Islamic Law Reference Center is located. You'd use the computer catalog to find out the relevant 9th century biographical literature that's related to the case that you were looking up, the collections of prophetic reports, relevant law treatises, historical chronicles, theological works. All this would be necessary to grasp the medieval Islamic legal case and shepherdize it, if you will, to see, that is, if, if there are updates um, or to investigate what the context of the case is that you're examining. And I was able to do this over the course of 10 years on a book project, that I, on the book project that I just described, and I loved every moment of it, but the entire process made me wonder how research on Islamic law might be done better or made more accessible, particularly to anyone interested in studying Islamic law as law in a comparative context, as I was. It simply can't be the case that in order to say anything about Islamic law, one needs to spend 10 years at Yale, Princeton, and Harvard libraries uh, with some trips abroad. And this got me thinking. What if it were possible to make these sources accessible online the way Westlaw and Lexis, Nexus made American law accessible? What if a researcher interested in the historical or comparative study of Islamic law could log into uh, an online portal from anywhere in the world and access the main sources for Islamic law in the modern and historic Muslim world? 
And what if this kind of open access allowed for more comparative, empirical, and collaborative studies of Islamic law? So these questions prompted my interest in developing two major projects, which we are in the process of launching at the Islamic Legal Studies program in the coming years. And so I'll just briefly show you uh, what they're about as, as I conclude. So the first is Sharia Source, uh, or a project I call Sharia Source, and it will provide the first searchable online portal to Islamic law with court cases, legislation, regulatory decisions, and the like, uh, both in uh, the modern world and uh, the historic sources that I, I described from ninth century Baghdad. And the idea is that this sort of portal can allow the type of vertical depth and horizontal breadth in the comparative study of Islamic law that has before only been available to specialist scholars who have access to the libraries um, or who are able to collaborate offline. And the second project is called Hadith Map, uh, which as its name suggests would be a method of uh, mapping hadith or prophetic reports that form the second major body of Islamic legal scholarship. So this is a map, a mapped out version of one of the main hadith reports that I, that I studied in constructing the book. Um, the boxes at the bottom are the published sources and I went through a process of following the oral reports uh, through the chains of transmission all the way to the Prophet Muhammad in the seventh century over this three or four century spread that I have uh, listed here. And the idea there too would be to have scholars collaborate together um, to allow better visual mapping of the networks and the, the biographies and the host of information that go behind it. Sort of this one page represents about 100 uh, written pages and, and volumes of work otherwise. So to conclude, we think of the transformations that have occurred over the past quarter century with the introduction of digital American law. Uh, we might think of what's possible for Islamic law. And in an effort to bring Islamic law back to the future through uh, digital Islamic law, my big idea is that the creative use of technology can come to bear on rather old storylines in Islamic law and history to create new possibilities that might stretch both the storyline and the imagination for Islamic law.